Understanding Microprocessors and Expandable Z80 Computer For anyone interested in electronics, the time is sure to come when they decide to learn a little more about how microprocessors work. These short videos will hopefully give some plenty of inspiration to the beginner to help them take steps in the right direction. For many people, the PIC type microcontroller has an obvious way to move forward. These devices make it easy to produce a circuit that's fast and powerful with a minimum of complexity. Take for example the 16F887 you see here by Microchip. In its 40 pin package it contains a program memory, RAM, timers, serial comms and other IO devices thereby making it potentially a very useful device. I started dabbling with micros a long time before this type of device was conceived so I tended to stick with the traditional type of microprocessor with my own exception being the short lived Philips 8400 series microcontroller. You can find a short video uh, about this device if you're interested on my uh, YouTube collection. Other microcontrollers out there of course including the ever popular 8031 a device seriously worth contemplating if your microcontroller seems to be the right way forward for you. Over the years there have been many 8-bit microprocessors designed and used in the assortment of commercial products. Early examples include the 88, the 6502 and the Motorola 6800. I don't have any examples of the latter here, so here are a few examples of the Motorola 6809. The most widely used of them all, however, was the Zilog Z80. This device started out seeing use in the middle 1970s and it's still in use today in some products. Over the years, it's also been made by several other manufacturers, including Mostec, SGS, and Toshiba. Aside from increasing the maximum clock frequency of the Z80 over the years, other more complex variants were produced later on, such as the Z8000, the Z280 and the Z380, these three being relatively unsuccessful when compared to Motorola's much more powerful 68000 16-bit device which came out at about the same time. Perhaps at this point it's worth mentioning that the idea of using one of these more complex devices is not recommended for a beginner starting out. I myself found the extra complexity of the early Intel 8088 experiment didn't really offer anything much over that of the Z80 for example, hence I'd advise against a beginner starting out with this particular CPU, or for that matter with the Intel 8186, 286, 386, 486 and Pentium as seen here. Another processor I'd be tempted to avoid would be the 8086. Don't confuse this with a device called the 8-bit 8085, which is actually an excellent 8-bit processor for the beginner starting out. Aside from the current availability and relative simplicity of interfacing, the Z80 stands out as an ideal contender for the DIY processor, because unlike some of the others of its time, it's a static device. This means that it can be single clock stepped in real time, therefore making it perfect for the experiment to learn exactly how the thing works. The lack of multiplexed address and data buses also reduce the complexity and chip count for DIY circuits as well. Back to the larger and more complex chips, the Z280 might be worth considering for incorporation into experimental circuits as it can be run in Z80 mode, which means it's compatible with the standard Z80 code and bus lines. It also includes some other useful features in the one package such as three 16-bit counters and a UART for serial comms, particularly useful if you're considering using these in a project. It's a pity it has multiplex address and data bus as it just increases its complexity here. I have however used this device in the past and plan to use another again shortly. This diagram shows how the outline idea is for a rig to learn how a processor actually works. The rig is obviously far more complicated than the circuitry needed for a simple microprocessor based device one might build such as a digital clock. I mention digital clock as it's always good to see something actually performing a simple but useful function. Here's an outline for the basics one needs to make a complete working circuit as a self-contained device. It no longer needs the complexity of the hex keypad decoder or the expense of the LEDs or displays used for the data and address buses which could be changed far too fast for anybody to see it anyway. Something has come up in conversation several times is what can you actually do and make with a microprocessor? If I look around and see what I've made over the years, it's usually something totally unique and tailored to what I'm looking for at the time. A couple of recent examples being a continuous Morse code generating device and a Morse code training device. This latter one generates random letters and numbers in Morse, selected from the ones one wants to practice at that time. I also have made an assortment of signal generating devices recently to provide input material for World War II radar and navigation equipment. Understandably, these incorporate all manner of different interfacing devices such as digital to analog and analog to digital converters. Another project I just thought of, I made many, many years ago, was an electronic game for a village fate. 
which randomly chose the winning leg on a giant beetle on a board. It played two short musical tunes if the leg chosen was either a winner or a loser. There are also a few flashing LEDs and displays to make it look more fun as well, of course. Out of curiosity, I went up in the loft just now and found that the game is actually still up there and intact, so I brought it down, plugged it in, and hey presto, it still works. Amazing. However, the eight oscillators have drifted a little bit over time and are a bit out of tune. Upon pressing the reset button, it tests all the oscillators and flashes a wind light. OK, enough of that. For your interest, here are the three electronics modules needed to drive the game. This is a crystal oscillator, dividers and power regulator. The second is the Z80 processor with onboard ROM and RAM, plus the third includes the eight oscillators for the music and a seven segment display driver, etc. Note that the processor board has IEC connectors on it. That's because I made several identical units for a number of different projects. Construction. Making a circuit using 8-bit micro inevitably needs quite a lot of wiring. Bear in mind those 16 address lines and 8 data lines. Fortunately, not every peripheral device will need connections to all of these. In order to keep track of what needs to be connected to what, I usually create a net list like the one shown here. This makes it a relatively easy job to ensure that no wires are unintentionally left off. Note that this sheet shows the core wiring from the processor, the ROM, the RAM and other essential parts for the Motorola 6809 used in a PC80 keyboard decoder. Along the top of the sheet is the IC along with the wire signal name down the left hand side. Let's take for example the bar right signal connection near the bottom of the list. This connects to 6809 pin 32, the 6116 RAM pin 21, the 8530 interface device pin 35, the 7414 pin 9 and nothing else. Here's a computer generated netlist to compare it. Quite different to the hand drawn one. I personally find the one that I created in the spreadsheet much easier to follow. Wiring. How one actually makes the circuit is up to the individual. I personally use a Vero strip board and glue on multiple wiring combs and direct a very thin wire from pin to pin via a wiring pen. Others may wish to try different methods themselves. In my opinion, the idea of using a printed circuit board to make a circuit doesn't seem such a good idea because it's a lot of hard work and could well need alterations or modifications after the device has been built. Z80 computer shown in our next video was in fact the second Z80 project I ever attempted, the first being designed all wrong in the first place and it never worked. My second attempt used several different attempts at wiring the ICs up and it shows some of the parts uh, were wired using thin white PTFE covered wire on both front and back of the board whilst the other parts later on used a very thin enameled wire just on the back and it was glued on with an assortment of things ranging from tip X to silicon rubber. In other words it still looks a real mess as you can see here but I learnt a lot in constructing it and it still works today.